Good afternoon and welcome to today's Center for Race and Gender Forum, Archipelagos and Specters, Refugee Settlers and Climate Refugees, a conversation with Neil Ahuja and Evan Leigh Espiritu Gandhi. Before we begin, let me say that there's live captioning available if you locate the button on the bottom right hand corner of your screen. I want to begin with the land acknowledgement. We take a moment to recognize that Berkeley sits on the territory of Kuchun, the ancestral and unceded lands of the Chechenya speaking Ohlone people, the successors of the historic and sovereign Barona Band of Alameda County. This land was and continues to be of great importance to the Mawekma Ohlone tribe and other familial descendants of the Verona Band. We recognize that every member of the Berkeley community has and continues to benefit from the use and occupation of this land since the institution's founding in 1868. Consistent with our values of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship to native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold the University of California Berkeley more accountable to the needs of American Indian and indigenous peoples. My name is Letty Volpe and I'm the director of the Center for Race and Gender here at UC Berkeley. We're thrilled that you can be with us for today's event, which is a conversation between professors Neil Ahuja and Evan Leigh Espiritu Gandhi about their two incredible recent books. Um, this event is hosted by the Center for Race and Gender's Native Immigrant Refugee Crossings Research Initiative and is co-sponsored by the Berkeley Interdisciplinary Migration Initiative, the Department of Ethnic Studies, the Center for Southeast Asian Studies, Asian American Studies, and Native American Studies. Thank you all so much for your support of this work. So I'm gonna introduce our two speakers um, and we're gonna hear from, in, from them in this order. First, we'll hear from Neil Ahucha. Neil Ahuja is professor in the Harriet Tubman Department of Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Maryland College Park. His work focuses on topics of race, migration, and security as they intersect uh, scholarship in feminist science and environmental studies. Neil is the author of Bio Insecurities, Disease Interventions, Empire, and the Government of Species, published by Duke University Press in 2016 as his first book, um, and has also written recent essays examining the medicalized articulations of race in two arenas, US counterterrorism detention and the epidemiology of COVID-19. Neil will be speaking about his second book, The Incredible Planetary Specters, Race, Migration and Climate Change in the 21st Century published in 2021 by UNC Press. We will then hear from Evan Leigh Espiritu Gandhi. Evan is an assistant professor of Asian American studies at UCLA, Povanar. Her work engages critical refugee studies, settler colonial and indigenous studies and trans-Pacific studies. Evan will be speaking about her book, amazing book, Archipelago of Resettlement, Vietnamese refugee settlers and decolonization across Guam and Israel-Palestine, which was published open access by University of California Press in April, 2022. Uh, this past summer, Evan organized a public history exhibit based on this book's research entitled Remembering Saigon from Vietnam to Guam. She is currently co-editing an anthology, Rutledge Handbook of Refugee Narratives with Vin Nguyen, as well as working on a second book project tentatively entitled Revisiting the Southern Question, South Korea, South Vietnam, and the US South. Evan hosts a podcast, Distorted Footprints, through her critical refugee studies class. And I will say I'm very proud that um, Evan was, a, as a graduate student at UC Berkeley, a recipient of the Center for Race and Gender Graduate Student Research Grant. Thank you. And I'm going to now turn it over to Neil and then Evan, uh, and then we'll hold a conversation. There'll be time at the end for a uh, discussion with the audience. So please do post comments and questions in the Q&A box on the bottom of the screen. So without further ado, let me turn it over to Neil. Thank you. Um, 
Thank you so much, uh, Letty, for that wonderful introduction, um, to Ariana for all of the work you did to set up the event, and to Evan for um, being, you know, giving me this opportunity to be in conversation with you after, um, after publishing this amazing book. Um, so I can't wait to talk about yours, but I think we have to talk about mine as well. So I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna do that, but um, I hope you don't mind that I might do it in um, a way that foregrounds some things that I've been thinking about since the book has come out um, over the past few weeks, especially I've been thinking a lot about the floods in Pakistan and, um, and the fact that those floods are taking place as many people in South Asia and the diaspora are thinking about the 75th anniversary of partition. Um, and so although Planetary Specters was published before the floods, um, you know, part of what I wanted to do was to um, share a little bit of some of the arguments and ideas from the book in that context. So uh, I'm going to share my screen here and let's see if, um, so th this is, this is the book. Um, and um, when thinking about uh, how climate change and migration um, relate in the current moment, I've been uh, thinking a little bit with an essay recently published by M. Abdullah Khalid, um, who uh, has documented some of the histories behind the current floods in Pakistan. And so I'm just showing you briefly here on the top left corner, you can see areas where uh, homes were destroyed um, in Pakistan during the recent floods, as well um, on the bottom left as showing some of the population concentration along those same river pathways. Um, and on the bottom right, you'll see that, um, you know, the current Indian government um, has been putting out some political advertising that um, might have us think about these river systems as ones that are contested. Um, you can even see in the upper right corner that uh, the Tarbela Dam uh, is one in which there's huge amounts of water kind of overflowing into the nearby communities. Um, so, you know, part of what I'm thinking about at the moment is how the Radcliffe line, which separates India and Pakistan, was drawn to divide not only peoples, but waterways, forests, mountains, and farmed lands. And a diplomatic effort between India and Pakistan in the decade following partition was devoted to the management of water along the Indus River Basin and other Western river systems, which culminated in a 1960 treaty, the Indus Water Treaty that governs irrigation, hydropower, and other uses of these rivers. The potential for flood or drought in South Asia is regularly raised among security officials as a potential source of climate-generated conflict. <clears throat> in contemporary journalism and security policy focusing on the risks of environmental warfare, Partition is rarely mentioned, but constitutes an unacknowledged backdrop to US and European climate war planning. In the speculative scenarios of climate war, which I discuss at greater length in the book, the Radcliffe line serves as the site of speculated resource conflicts and migrations that portend widely distributed displacement and social violence. Now, in the East, um, we see that Bangladesh is often described in this literature as the world's most climate-threatened country, with those at risk of displacement from serious flooding estimated to be even higher than the scale of the original partition migrations at some 22 million. In the West, monsoon rains have caused cataclysmic flooding in Pakistan affecting tens of millions of people in both 2010 and 2022. And while climate security experts frame this in terms of degradation narratives that combine resource scarcity with the vision of destabilizing migrations, Activists and affected communities who look more directly at struggles to survive in riverine communities often focus instead on the common tactics of these three post-colonial states in establishing large dams and other forms of development that change the flow of rivers, that make coastal regions susceptible to floods and droughts, and that displace those who subsist upon, uh, along the rivers, often in agrarian and indigenous communities. So the difference here is stark, and in the climate security literature, Influenced by those Malthusian visions of resource war, we see anxiety over the potential for failed states. From the vantage of those who subsist along the river or face scarcity for, of water in the cities, it's more common to learn that state policies, land profiteering, and unequal access to services and benefits have greater impacts on social precarity and environmental harm. On this point, 
those who advocate for environmental protections, including those um, depicted here, such as the Pakistan Fisher Folk Forum, who seek to protect the Indus River in the Sindh province, invoke land reform, peasant rights, and even rights for the river itself as more basic paths to ensuring the sustenance of the river ecology. While abstract visions of interstate water wars conjure rivers as a resource that can be partitioned, grappling with the living ebbs and flows of the river require more precise, calcu uh, re precise questions. Can a river be partitioned? If so, where should we locate the cuts that reorient its body, its migration, and in the aftermath of its hydrological change? Is the border located only on maps or at the site of a dam, the siphon point for a new irrigation stream, or the dried tributary where fish can no longer spawn? How does the change in the flow of a river shrink, extend, or transform the sense of coastal hab habitability for diverse groups of fishers, farmers, and other workers dependent on the water? Since water systems configure human and animal habitation in so many parts of the world, it shouldn't be a surprise that flows of rivers are often useful in the ways that communities mark their sense of time. This is true not only for the cyclicality of water movements and the seasonality of food production, but also of the very notions of home that transform after major climatic or development transitions. Such transitions in river systems in South Asia, of course, took place earlier in the 19th century history of colonial development along ports and deltas in Bengal, even as more recent changes, such as the one that we've witnessed in recent weeks, um, in the form of uh, which come about from large dams and irrigation systems, uh, also spurring change in the river system, make adjustments appear to be more sudden and massive. The debates over whether present environmental crises are best defined apocalypse, such as in labels like Anthropocene, Capitalocene, Plantationocene, etc., might be recast when the effects of development on a river system, either in 19th century Calcutta or in more recent flooding events in coastal Bangladesh, cause groups of people who subsist along the waterway to migrate temporarily or permanently in search of steadier incomes. Although we need to grapple with the long durée of ecological change and its colonial roots, these temporal frames need to be further articulated in relation to the time of social reproduction, as well as to the more recent histories of neoliberal environmental thought that often contain stereotyped visions of global south over population and degradation. Why have water-related migrations, which are on the rise in South Asia with intensified weather disasters, why have they failed so far to produce the kinds of climate war described as conventional state-to-state -state warfare in US security discourse? Such forms of mobility need to be considered in terms of the intimate geographies of reproductive labor that constitute the life worlds of many migrant workers. When a flooding event leads a family to send one of the children to labor in a city, this production of a diasporic kinship isn't necessarily one that divorces that child from the reproductive labor of the household leading to mass and sudden flight. In fact, the endeavor to produce a remittance income after a failed harvest or a loss of arable land might tie the worker deeply to the natal community and the work of the household, whose limited resources may be used to propel that worker to the city and commute back at intervals. The problem of personal or household debt may solidify such relationships between localized reproductive and displaced formal labor which could in turn affect how migration pathways end up being imaginable or not, whether they, they be more localized, like rural to urban pathways, or trans-regional connections such as those that the Bangladeshi government itself has promoted between South Asia and the Gulf states over the past half century. So when I talk about such scenarios in planetary specters, one of the arguments I make is that the outcomes of disaster are not so deterministic as the media icon of the climate refugee might suggest. Um, and in the book, I talk about um, you know, news images like these. Um, we have one on the bottom right that talks about climate change as the driver of the migrant caravan, which is an odd way to describe it, given the way that activist groups were involved in organizing caravans as forms of political protest um, that had specific policies and governments in mind. Um, because the migration experiment, experience cannot be comprehensively rendered, by configuring the refugee as an individuated legal subject divorced from networks of social reproduction, nor from global level narratives of geopolitical disaster and displacement, we can begin to inquire into the reproductive labors, knowledge and transit networks, and unequal social conditions that propel the refugee figure along established paths, 
and which portend many possible outcomes, ranging from return home to serial displacement. As such, migration itself often requires a certain amount of capital, time, or other resources that are easier to satisfy for those with greater resources or social status among the affected community. And the so-called climate migrant is one whose apparent choices and pathways are in many ways guided by social equality, inequalities embedded in structures of racial capitalism. So chapter two of the book uh, goes in depth into how those structures have been driven by the oil economy and a kind of transnational logistics economy uh, in the past 50 years. The reason that I, following a tradition of scholars in political ecology and feminist development studies, argue against much talk of climate refugees has less to do with the inability of experts or states to arrive at a legal definition of the climate refugee, and more to do with my sense that the conventional climate refugee discourse and images tend to abstract environmental process from the limited paths for accumulation that migrants transit. And of course, there's a whole humanitarian apparatus of representation wrapped up in this that um, it, you know, often describes the climate refugee as a kind of disabled figure um, crossing borders and in need of um, immediate relief from a receiving state. Speaking of the limited paths of accumulation for many migrants, the fact that climate adaptation schemes themselves have in some instances accelerated forms of displacement in coastal regions stands as one of the most unfortunate outcomes of the class divides that frame climate justice struggles. The expansion of shrimp aquaculture as a response to sea level rise and salinization in the Bengal Delta has been one of these outcomes, where adaptation schemes underwrite attempts by landowners to grab and permanently salinize land that might otherwise be used for subsistence rice cultivation. Here are some images of um, shrimp aquaculture in Bangladesh. <clears throat> as detailed by Kasia Papraki, the imagined human capital of agriculture workers relocated to cities dovetails with projects that preemptively attempt to clear economically precarious people in flood prone regions. On this point, I want to quote from a 2009 Bangladeshi government climate action plan that dovetails with a longer history of Bangladeshi state promotion of outmigration. It has been estimated that there is the impending threat of displacement of more than 20 million people in the event of a sea level change and the resulting increase in salinity coupled with the impact of increased cyclones and storm surges in the near future. The settlement of these environmental refugees will pose a serious problem for the densely populated Bangladesh and migration must be considered a valid option for the country. Preparations in the meantime will be made to convert this population into trained and useful citizens for any country. Trained and useful citizens is, of course, a, a very loaded phrase. Um, and the preemptive configuration of flood affected peoples as migrant human capital views resettlement as a solution to the shrinking horizons of livability for saturated coast coastal regions. The way that this is sometimes configured, uh, including by the IPCC, is very telling. And um, I think that the connection to Evan's book is really interesting on this because the IPC configures these migrants as holders of indigenous climate adaptation knowledge um, without um, kind of attention paid to how indigenous peoples in a resettlement location might be affected um, by this. So the IPCC describes migration itself as an adaptation strategy. And um, in the last two IPCC large reports, numbers four and five, um, called for indigenous knowledge through migration to be shared for international efforts to support climate adaptation. What would it mean instead to acknowledge the reproductive labor of these frontline communities as a kind of crisis sink that disperses the current offloading of health and ecological risks generated by fossil fuel use? There's much more that can be said about the racialization of environmental displacement, the intensely lived crisis time of frontline communities, the histories of oil fueled racial capitalism that configure regimes of mobility, and the limitations of rights based legal redress. But one lesson we can take away from disasters like the ongoing one in Pakistan is that while those affected may experience the rapid shock of crisis, so often thought of in our current kind of um, cultural productions of disaster, they often experience the slow withering of life worlds characteristic of an already ongoing structural disposability, which has just as much to do with the outcomes that are often uh, kind of papered over in the figure of climate refugee status. <clears throat>
In the difference between these two temporalities of disaster, fast and slow, it's my hope we can find some resources for challenging imperial cartographies of racial capitalism that make displacement appear as an increasingly inevitable object of securitization. Here, we might instead find some resources for thinking migrant solidarities attentive to racial capitalism's force, not only in the spectacular blowback of climate events, but also in the very structures of fossil fueled life that guide our many migrant journeys. So that's all for now. <laughs> Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So I'll go ahead um, and jump in. So thank you so much, um, Neil. It's so such a pleasure to hear more about your work and I love how you're tying into what's happening in Pakistan as well. Um, and I'm so excited to be here. So thank you, Letty, for the kind introduction. You know, thank you as well, Ariana, for all the organizing and getting us to here together. Um, as Letty mentioned, you know, and this is also kind of a return for me. So I'm very grateful that the Center for Race and Gender sponsored this research when it was still in the dissertation phase. So it feels like quite an honor to return um, and share the book and more about the research now that it's completed. So I'm zooming in today from Los Angeles, also known as Tavangar, on the traditional homelands of the Gabalino Tongva peoples. And I'd also just like to pay my respects to the Ohlone people of Northern California. So I'm gonna go ahead um, and share screen and share a couple slides um, as well to talk about the book project. Okay, so I'm honored to be speaking here as part of the Native Immigrant Refugee Crossings Research Initiative, since the book is also invested in these kinds of crossings as well. So Archipelago of Resettlement, Vietnamese Refugee Settlers and Decolonization Across Guam and Israel-Palestine puts critical refugee studies in conversation with Indigenous and Settler Colonial Studies to ask a couple main questions. So first, what happens when refugees are resettled in settler colonial states on indigenous lands and waters? How does the figure of the archipelago and the Vietnamese concept of milk enable us to make critical connections between different spaces of refugee resettlement, US empire, settler colonial displacement, and indigenous resistance? And I'll talk more about this Vietnamese concept of nook, but one of its meanings, of course, is water. So I'm really interested by a lot of the questions and water politics um, that Neil was posing as well. So in my brief comments today, I'd like to introduce the concept of the refugee settler condition, discuss the book's metaphors and methodologies, and then give you a preview of some of the book's main case studies. Um, and if you're interested in learning more, um, I'm happy to share that the book is published open access, as Letty mentioned. Um, so Ariana will drop a link uh, in the chat where you can download it um, for free if you'd like to um, read more. So I'm actually going to start by reading to you um, from the opening pages of the introduction of the book to begin my discussion of how the Vietnamese concept of nuke and the figure of the archipelago inform my relational methodology. And I'll explain a bit more as well what I mean by the Vietnamese, by the refugee settler condition. So here's the book. So I'm gonna to read to you a little bit and then I'll talk and return again to my comments. Okay, so we'll talk about nuke first. Vietnam is nuke, water, country, homeland, land is water, water is land. A duality without division, a contrast without contradiction. Nuke Vietnam, a home, a cradle, a point of departure one island in the archipelago of diasporic collectivity. According to Vietnamese mythology, Vietnam was born out of the consummation of water and land. Alka, the mountain fairy, fell in love with Lak Nong Quan, the sea dragon king. Together they produced a hundred human children, Lak Ye. But Alka longed for the mountains and Lak Nong Quan longed for the sea, and so they separated dividing their children across the lands and waters of Vietnam. Perhaps this originary division of a mother's children prefigured future cleavages, the division of North from South Vietnam along the 17th parallel in 1954, followed by two decades of civil war and US military intervention, and then the division of a unified Vietnam from its post-1975 refugee diaspora who fled war's aftermath by air and by sea, who touched down on new lands and were washed in salt water. 
Vietnamese refugees resettled around the world, forging new islands of belonging in the respective countries of asylum. Collectively, these islands make up an archipelago of resettlement, a post-war diaspora connected by the fluid memory of a beloved homeland lost to war. As the Pacific Ocean links what Tongan writer Apeli Haofa famously termed a sea of islands, so too does Nuuk connect the archipelago of Vietnamese refugee resettlement. But resettlement is vexed when refugees resettle in settler colonial states. Resettlement is unsettling when predicated on the systematic dispossession of indigenous peoples. So this book asks, what are the political implications of refugees claiming refuge on stolen indigenous land? Do archipelagos of refugee resettlement reinforce ongoing structures of settler colonialism? Or can they be refracted through Nuuk, a land water dialectic to call forth decolonial solidarities? So these questions I think challenge us to think through distinct yet overlapping modalities of refugee and indigenous displacement shaped by entangled histories of war, imperialism, settler colonialism, and US military violence. They invite us to imagine new forms of ethical relationality. Um, and I'll just pause here and say that I think part of Neil's presentation too is to think about those overlaps between refugees who also might be indigenous displaced peoples as well. Okay, so I'll return to the reading. Iunuk, to love one's country, the highest virtue demanded of a Vietnamese. Muk Nuk, to lose one's country, to be without the life source of water. Lam Nuk, to make water slash land, to quench the thirst of a parched heart. So this book puts indigenous and settler colonial studies in conversation with critical refugee studies in order to theorize what I call the refugee settler condition. So the vexed positionality of refugee subjects whose citizenship in a settler colonial state is predicated on the unjust dispossession of an indigenous population. So I'm gonna skip a little ahead in the book and talk a little bit more about this concept of the refugee settler. So refugee settlers, I argue, are not directly responsible per se for the settler colonial policies of the state into which they are both interpolated, so P-O-L, and then interpolated, P-E-L-L. -L. However, their processes of homemaking, of creating an island of belonging in their new country of resettlement, do take place on contested land, rendering them what Michael Rothberg has theorized as implicated subjects. The challenge then is to put refugee critiques of the nation state in conversation with indigenous critiques of settler colonialism in order to challenge settler colonial states monopoly over the land and the sea. Articulated together, refugee modalities of statelessness and indigenous epistemologies of human land water relations can unsettle settler colonial state violence, pointing us toward more pluralized forms of collective belonging routed through Nuuk. To Lam Nuuk then to make water slash land is to forge decolonial solidarities and futurities. All right, so I'm gonna to return to uh, some of my comments for this presentation. So now that we've talked um, a little bit about the Vietnamese concept of Nuuk, I'd like to elaborate a bit more on this figure of the archipelago and how it relates to the book's relational methodology. So like Nuuk, an archipelago, right, is made up of both land and water, a duality without division, a contrast without contradiction. So land, understood as, in Mishuana Goman's words, quote, a storied site of human interaction, and a quote, meaning making pro process rather than a claimed object, end quote, is a key focus of indigenous sovereignty movements. Indigenous sovereignty, moreover, is distinct from nation state sovereignty and how it's articulated. And that indigenous sovereignty, according to Irene Watson, quote, embraces diversity and focuses on inclusivity rather than exclusivity, end quote. And then since land is settler colonialism's quote, specific irreducible element to quote Patrick Wolfe, it's arguably at the heart of indigenous people's struggles for sovereignty. So let's talk a little bit about water. Water connotes fluidivity, fugitivity, movement and connectivity. The erosion of borders by the constant waves of the sea. Um, and I really loved this question that Neil posed of how can we partition a river, right? And rivers do cross borders. So how can that 
um, sort of inform our thinking as well. So water is a salient medium and metaphor for diaspora and forced displacement from the Black Atlantic to the Trans-Pacific, from Syrian to Vietnamese boat refugees. Water, however, I wanna say is not in opposition to land and the figure of the archipelago refracted through Vietnamese epistemologies of milk remind us of the entanglements between land and water, indigenous and refugee. That is, indigenous peoples can be refugees of settler colonial displacement, and refugees in turn can become settlers on indigenous lands and waters. According to Chickasaw scholar Jody Bird, indigeneity's quote, emphasis on the specificities of origin, place, and belonging, end quote, is not in opposition to quote, movement, dispersal, and diaspora, end quote. So I really appreciate how she's pushing against, right, these binary oppositions. So this duality, I think, is also really apparent in Pacific Islander scholarship that I'm really inspired by, which theorizes Oceania as a life force connecting indigenous island nations to one another, as well as their respective diasporas. So according to Lanny Thompson, archipelagics emphasize, quote, discontinuous connections rather than physical proximity, fluid movements across porous margins rather than delimited borders, and complex spatial networks rather than oblique horizons of landscapes. In some, moving islands rather than fixed geographical formations, end quote. So this idea of archipelagics also calls to mind Edgar Glissant's poetics of relation, right? So thinking about this philosophy grounded in the Antilles archipelago, quote, in which each and every identity is extended through a relationship with the other, end quote. So relational archipelagics marks this book's metaphors, methodology, and cartographies. So thinking about the practice of tracing an archipelago of Vietnamese refugee resettlement, right? So Vietnamese resettlement to Guam, as well as to Israel-Palestine, which I'll talk about, and how that can in turn illuminate an archipelago of the U.S. empire. So I really want to think about how the Vietnam War is linked to U.S. military buildup in Guam, as well as an unwavering military and political support of the state of Israel. But we can also think about a corresponding archipelago of trans-Indigenous resistance, and I'm borrowing this term trans-Indigenous from Chadwick Allen. So thinking, for example, about connections between the Chamorro decolonization efforts and Palestinian liberation struggles, and one way we can think about those connections or trace them materially it's tracing where the Vietnamese refugee figure ended up. So the figure of the archipelago emerges from the specificity of these book sites of analysis, right? This is not just something that I'm imposing as an academic scholar upon these sites, but rather emerges um, imminent, more imminently. So I wanna talk a little bit more about Guam. So Guam, as many of us know, is actually part of a larger archipelago of indigenous Chamorro land, the Marianas. Centuries of Spanish and then U.S. colonization, however, have divided Guam from its 14 sister islands to the north. After the Spanish-American War in 1898, the United States took over Guam, while Germany took over the Northern Marianas. Following Germany's defeat in World War I, Japan ruled over the Northern Marianas until its own defeat in World War II, and World War II plays a really key role in Guam's history. So to this day, the Chamorro people remain divided over these two distinct political entities, even as they are connected by water, right? So we have the unincorporated territory of Guam, whose residents are US citizens, but who cannot vote for the US president, and then the Commonwealth of the Northern Mariana Islands. So to retain an archipelagic imaginary, therefore, is to resist what Chamorro scholar Tiara Naputi calls, quote, colonial cartographic violence, end quote. Moreover, since World War II, Guam has been heavily militarized. And today the US military continues to occupy one third of the island's territory, manifesting in Catherine Lutz's words, quote, the highest ratio of US military spending and military hardware and land takings from indigenous US populations of any population of any place on earth, end quote. So really wanna think about how this militarized environment then affects Vietnamese refugees coming in. So I'm gonna talk about Palestine first though. Palestine has become increasingly archipelagic and Israeli, as Israeli settlement and occupation disrupt the contiguity of Palestinian life worlds. So Palestine and Israel is not obviously or not literally an archipelago, right? 
but I really want to turn to this map, the archipelago of Eastern Palestine, um, created by the French artist, artist Julian Buzak, um, to think about the archipelagic nature of Palestinian life worlds and their curtailment of mobility. Um, and I want to give a shout out to uh, Keith Feldman, who I think is in the audience and was one of my dissertation advisors, who first introduced me to this map. So it was really influential in my thinking. So this map takes the 1995 Oslo Accords division of the West Bank into A, B, and C zones as a point of departure, illustrating in scholar Jennifer Lynn Kelly's words, quote, how settler colonial state practice can create island formations without water, end quote. So now that I've elaborated on the concept of Nook and the figure of the archipelago, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the book's main case studies. So Vietnamese refugee migration to Guam and Israel, Palestine to elaborate on what I call the refugee settler condition. So from April to November, 1975, the US military processed over 112,000 Vietnamese refugees on the unincorporated territory of Guam during what was called Operation New Life. And this was actually the first major US processing center for Vietnamese refugees after the end of the Vietnam War. And I really like to turn to this uh, photograph, which I found in my archival research um, at the Micronesian Area Research Center at the University of Guam, because I think it really brings to mind um, a lot of what critical refugee studies is trying to do, which is to push against right this figure of the destitute refugee, um, of the refugee in need of saving, as Neil sort of talked about, and really thinking about you know refugees smiling, right? How they actually make the most and they make the best of a very difficult situation can actually create new life worlds in the camps and beyond. And I'm gonna turn now to the other case study. So from 1977 to 1979, the state of Israel granted asylum and citizenship to 366 non-Jewish Vietnamese refugees. Um, and this is a really important case study within Israeli domestic politics, because it's the first time that Israel offered asylum and then eventual even citizenship to non-Jewish um, refugees. And it's actually a, quite a case um, of exception. So in more recent asylum case, um, cases of folks claiming asylum in Israel, Israel has been really reticent or hesitant to say yes and offer asylum to other refugees. So why was the Vietnamese case such an exception? So for Guam, right, we can ask, how do Vietnamese refugees relate to the Chamorro decolonization movement? And for Israel-Palestine, the question becomes, how do Vietnamese refugees who are granted Israeli citizenship, right, and the settler colonial state relate to the Palestinian liberation struggle? So I'm gonna talk a little bit about method. So Archipelago of Resettlement is a profoundly interdisciplinary project that necessitated multiple methodologies, archival research, oral histories, and literary and film analysis. So I conducted original archival research in Guam, Israel, Palestine, and the continental US to better understand how the US military in Guam and the Zionist government in Israel represented Vietnamese refugees and talked about their resettlement efforts. I find that in Guam, the humanitarian rhetoric that newspapers and politicians used to describe Operation New Life actually retroactively justified settler militarism in Guam. And I'm borrowing this term settler militarism from Juliet Nabalin. And so by extension, this positioned Vietnamese refugees in a structurally antagonistic relationship to Chamorro decolonization struggles that were opposing and critiquing military settlement. So this structural antagonism is really important, right? So even disregarding um, Vietnamese refugees uh, sort of individual interests they were really turning to um, this kind of structures, right? And they're pitting these populations against one another. So in Israel, Palestine, Zionist leaders such as Prime Minister Menachem Begin drew parallels between Vietnamese refugees and Jewish refugees, while including the contemporaneous displacement of Palestinian refugees by Israeli settler colonial policies. Archival records, however, are largely told from the perspective of those in power. And therefore, I want to turn to oral histories with Vietnamese refugees and Guam and Israel, Palestine to better understand their experiences of the refugee settler condition. So in the oral histories I conducted for this project, I find that given the trauma of forced displacement, Vietnamese refugees expressed strong attachments to the land and waters of their resettlement, as well as sincere gratitude actually to the settler institutions that resettled men. So what in the book I call refugee settler desire. 
So the, for the most part, they view indigenous decolonization movements with wariness or even suspicion, expressing concern about further displacement under the uncertainties of what indigenous sovereignty looks like. So I really wanna take seriously, right? These reasons for why we see these structural antagonisms and what I call the refugee settler condition. But I also just don't wanna end there, um, but wanna to turn to few charities and decolonial solidarities. Then in order to do that, I really turn to cultural production from diasporic Vietnamese, Chamorro and Palestinian writers and artists to probe what Raymond Williams terms emergent structures of feeling. So thinking about these visions of decolonial solidarity that have yet to be fully articulated in the social realm. So I'm gonna end my presentation by just showing you a slide of some of these um, cultural productions that I talk about in the book. So you can see here works by Vietnamese diasporics and Israel-Palestine, as well as Guam. Um, and some of the earlier chapters of the book also look at the Vietnamese refugee connection within the US, um, uh, kind of continental US as well. So I'll go ahead and end there. And I look forward to our conversation. Thank you both so much. That was amazing. Um, we're going to do this exercise now where we're going to hear from Neil about Evan and Evan about Neil, and then we'll open it up to a broader conversation. So do post things in Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that we got um, this overview of the book from you because it really is breathtaking in scope. And um, if you haven't gotten to read uh, Archipelago of Resettlement yet, um, I, I'm really excited for the opportunity you're gonna have to see both the kind of methodological complexity of it, the original archival research, and then the sophistication of the analysis. And really though, I wanted to read a passage, if that's okay, because um, it's beautiful and it gets at the heart of, you know, some of the things that you're trying to um, articulate in this project that I think are relevant, you know, both in, in the context you look at and in some other ones that I've been thinking about. So this comes from the afterword. Um, this book insists on the importance of mapping archipelagic histories of refugee resettlement in order to envision decolonial futures. Yet history must not be uncritically memorialized. We must sift through the traces of the past to figure out which ones we cling to in order to keep the drift. I suggest we let go of attachments to settler colonialism, refugee displacement, and nation state exclusion, and work instead toward an archipelago of decolonization. Nook or what Vin Nguyen calls oceanic spatiality, the waterscape of the boat and of the sea, can help to wash away the debris. Um, and, and I found this passage um, both moving and resonant with a lot of the ways that critical refugee studies has this potential to ask difficult questions about the ways that refugee experiences and narratives have been um, hailed by different colonial states um, in ways that distort um, and even attach us um, affectively towards um, a, a kind of um, settled, colonized vision of oneself in the aftermath of migration. And it really um, reminds me of the various ways that in your book, the um, complexity of um, grappling with difference within the affected communities becomes so central to working out the politics of decolonization as it might be articulated with other groups. So, um, you know, one of the, the reasons that I'm, I'm so, you know, in love with this book is because it is, you know, it's not simply accepting these narratives of crisis and it's not allowing for us to sweep away the pre-existing power structures that characterize refugee life. And so um, there are a few points in the book that I wanted to just highlight. Um, one of them um, is thinking through the very terms of refugee and settler and, you know, focusing from even the early pages of the book on how both U.S. and Israeli settler states actually incorporate visions of the settler as refugee as part of the national mythology. And if that's, you know, already woven into the kind of colonial fabric of displacements, um, then there is a, a kind of need exactly for the for what I quoted from the afterward for a, a kind of disruption of those affective attachments to the lost homeland, 
um, and to the ways that that becomes scripted as a kind of national loss. Um, and I think that this um, translates into thinking about the refugee settler condition in ways that are extremely complex. First of all, acknowledging that indigenous peoples are all, also on the move um, and that the migrant or the refugee can in fact also, you know, bear indigeneity. And so what does it mean to think about the complexity of a U.S. settler militarism that is woven on lands in which, you know, many, many different peoples are being displaced and yet where so much of the energy of mobility is then being corralled into the militaristic and nationalistic policies that are being supported. And one of the, the kind of critical ways that the book gets into this complexity, there's many moments, but one of them is with the chapter on Operation New Life, which thinks about what it means when Vietnamese are resettled um, on Guam and that there are various forms of Chamorro um, uh, kind of articulations of critiques of the U.S. military, that doesn't necessarily translate into a kind of xenophobic, like, don't come here. Um, so how can we build upon these kinds of moments to develop that archipelagic vision of decolonization? This is one of the brilliant moves that the book makes, and it's not coming out of nowhere. It's coming out of these detailed histories that, um, that you develop. And so... Um, that waterscape of boat and sea that you're talking about in visions of a decolonizing future, this is um, a, a kind of vision of decolonization that I, I do see as opposed to the kind of armed lifeboat security discourse that we're witnessing with a lot of climate change discourse these days. So I'm just gonna end with this um, final point about how this connects to the, the figure of the climate refugee. Um, and, and I think that these are exactly the kinds of tracings of trans-regional connections that both mobilize our movements, but that also forge the grounds for how we kind of have to resist and also rethink our own community narratives. That's exactly the work that needs to be done to disrupt these overly broad narratives like the Anthropocene or the cl climate refugee. So I'm so taken with this book. I'm really honored that I got a chance to reflect on it today. And I hope I just didn't talk too long, but um, I really appreciated um, getting to share on this. And I have so much more to say, but I'm going to cut it off. <laughs> Thank you so much, Neil. It's such an honor to be in conversation with you. Um, so I don't have formal comments, but I just want to talk through, you know, some of what inspired me by reading your book, um, why I wanted to be in conversation with you. Um, and some of the key terms, you know, that both come up in the book, but also in the presentation today and then how they're really um, you know, I think can inspire a lot of the new work, you know, part of what I think is really interesting about this book is how you're drawing together all of these fields, right, which have not necessarily been in conversation with one another, right, so we have all these critiques of racial capitalism that haven't necessarily been talking to critical refugee studies in this way, and then you're also bringing in, right, this discourse about environmentalism, um, and of course, the sort of figure of the climate refugee in particular, um, and, you know, I think in my work, I'm have really focused on the sort of critique of humanitarianism that is associated with representations of the refugee. But I like how you actually turn us to this question of the securitization rhetoric as well, right? Um, so thinking about the security apparatus that is sort of then mobilized with the climate refugee as an excuse, right? Um, which is to say, thinking about how you use this term like destabilize, destabilizing migrations. And I really appreciate that term because we usually think about destabilized migrations, right? Migrants who have been destabilized from their homelands. Um, but how is that actually in a very insidious, insidious way, right? Then turned uh, to be destabilizing migrations, right? Um, which is to say that these, um, these migrants and these refugees who have different, you know, degrees of agency, which I think you point out, right? A lot of people are so migrating from the rural to the cities um, and they're responding, right? To these kind of like global capital flows, um, which they don't necessarily have control of. And so then these sort of global North states can in their sort of high, high mind, <laughs> I guess, sort of critique that from abroad without sort of recognizing, well, what are the longer, colonial histories that are play, right, um, that actually lead to um, these migration patterns. Um, so yeah, so I really appreciate this sort of critique of the, the climate security apparatus. 
Um, and really thinking about, you know, the causes, right? I think that's one sort of connection between both our projects, right? It's not taking refugee migration at face value, but rather giving this longer historical context, which is a longer critique of colonial forces as well as sort of empire and imperial forces. Um, so I really appreciate, you know, how you are drawing, you know, as well connecting this um, to the long history of the oil regimes um, in South and Southeast Asia um, and, and drawing that in together and really thinking about how climate refugee discourse, right, of course, this seems to be a contemporary phenomenon, or at least the media would, would lead us to believe so. Um, but how actually, you know, these movement of these longer um, histories. So I really appreciate um, that. Um, and the, I guess the last thing that I will say is that I also really appreciate, I think, the sort of geographical um, focus of your studies. So, you know, in my work, I'm much more familiar with the figure of the climate refugee um, in the Pacific and in Oceania. Um, and so I really appreciate how you turned us to spaces um, like Bangladesh um, and to think about um, these other cartographies, right? Um, in which these situations are happening. Um, so yeah, I guess I'll go ahead um, and end there, but I really appreciate being in conversation with you and I look forward to um, questions uh, from the audience as well. That was unbelievably generative to hear from both of you about each other, um, as well as about your own work. So I so appreciate it. A reminder to our audience, the Q&A box is open if you want to post questions. Um, but maybe one thing that we could, I mean, there's so many things that both connect these two books and also ways in which these two books diverge, right? So they're both writing in the space of critical refugee studies, right? So against the notion of the humanitarian or non-agentic um, subject who is acted upon, uh, but rather is a paradigmatic figure of geopolitical critique and what uh, it then shows us by focusing um, on these figures. Um, I'm really struck by the role of water in uh, both of your books and at the end of Neil's um, introduction, uh, Neil warns of this vision of this quote, permanently sinking future. And then at the end of Evan's book, Evan talks about only then can we keep afloat. And then of course, as she was talking about the whole idea of nook and water is, is so foundational. Um, anyway, so I was curious if you had more things to say about land and about water um, and how land and water are conventionally thought about in these two contexts and ways in which your work absolutely disrupts that. Um, I was also wondering if you might wanna take up the invitation to think more about indigeneity and refugees. So this is something very um, explicitly addressed uh, in Evan's book with the refugee settler condition and Chamorros on Guam. And how do we, this very path-breaking theorization of how do we think about these questions at the same time? And then as Neil was saying, the climate refugee who can also be this indigenous subject who's moving and the kind of complexities of thinking about the displacement by refugees um, or and of refugees uh, moving through space, this figure whose mobility is um, an adaptability, I think actually paired paired paradoxically, right, this notion, as Neil talks about, of this vision of the climate refugee as adaptable and resilient as kind of a model, as opposed to the kind of pathetic acted upon figure um, is really interesting. But if we think about the vision of the indigenous or the native, the immigrant and the refugee, what does pulling out refugee and indigenous specifically tell us that thinking about immigrant and indigenous does not, right? So one thing I was thinking about was um, the frequent reference people make to the Tongva drumming circle at Los Angeles airport. So when then President Donald Trump announced the Muslim ban, right, um, there was, um, you know, this very well publicized, no ban on stolen land, welcoming drumming circle, and this kind of very beautiful vision which was specifically around welcoming immigrants who were not refugees, but I think were 
perhaps perceived as such because of the coercion that was experienced of um, the Trump administration. So thinking about forced migration, voluntary migration, indigeneity, like how do we think about the layering of these different kinds of movements um, and communities and fields of study? I mean, there are all of these things uh, at the same time. Um, anyway, so maybe let me let me stop there and see if you have anything to say in response. You feel free if you have any thoughts to start. <laughs> Um, maybe I'll, I'll say a couple of words. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that I think that, um, you know, I, I draw from Neil's work is this idea that the climate refugee, um, for example, you know, this kind of like discourse, right, of the rising waters. So the kind of dominant discourse around climate refugees or climate change will usually articulate water, right, as a threat. And A, it's a kind of, you um, threat that has no history, right? Um, so it doesn't sort of look at you know, these longer histories of sort of historical colonial and, and imperial violence. Uh, but also I think really discounts um, concurrent understandings of water also as a life force, right? And so how can we think about these two things in, in, in conjunction, right? As not a dual, as a duality rather than a contradiction. Um, and, you know, it also reminds me as, um, you know, how Nook and how water also figures in sort of the Vietnamese, in particular, refugee um, imagination, right? So particularly for that later migrations of boat refugees, water is associated um, with the escape, with the boat refugee exodus, um, with sort of the, a lot of the deaths and drowning that happened. Um, but also water is associated with the homeland, right? It is considered um, milk and, and the sort of vex feelings that one has of having to leave um, a space and not, if, not knowing whether one could return. And even if one would return, right? It's not the same homeland that one left. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that both of our projects are really trying to complicate and hold the complexity of all these different meanings that uh, hold, right? And the kind of idea of water. Um, and yeah, maybe I'll just kind of you know, speak to these these overlaps, right, and these um, connections between refugee and, and immigrant and asylum seeker and also native and indigenous. Um, so, you know, I think one thing that critical refugee studies really tries to do is to expand the figure of the refugee to think about forced displacement and forced migration more broadly, right? Um, which is to say that it really pushes against a very narrow UN or United Nations understanding of who is considered a refugee, which is very legalistic and as no project shows like climate refugees, there's no legal you know, definition yet. And that's part of what makes this so tenuous and why the turn to law and international law can feel so tenuous. Um, and so, you know, I think that my project is very much in conversation and indebted to a lot of the conversations that were happening in Asian settler colonial studies and really thinking about Asian immigration in particular, including labor migration to work on the plantations in Hawaii. Um, and I really wanted to think about though the specificity of the refugee and the specificity of forced displacement, which is to say also that of course there's the continuum, right? There's not a clear black and white between who's an agential migrant or immigrant um, and who is a, a refugee. Um, but I think this question becomes even more vexed, right? When there is no sort of choice to leave one's homeland, right? And the ability to go back to one's homeland, um, especially when it's been torn by violence or one is a political refugee um, feels so impossible, right? And so how can we actually think about then making space um, on indigenous lands and waters and thinking about the ethical accountability that one can have to decolonial movements, um, which shouldn't necessarily be internalized um, as a threat of, oh, I'm going to be displaced again, you know. Um, at the same time, I think I really, in this project, wanted to, yeah, try to figure out why refugees might have that feeling of uh, concern. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I, and I love this line of questions um, that you shared with us. Um, I think that um, one of the kind of fascinating things about water um, is the reversals that sometimes happen where um, there is planning that goes on for years about how drought is going to be the disaster and then suddenly the Pakistan floods come. Um, and mm -hmm. um, sometimes these 
really these these kinds of expectations and anticipations where people are already kind of conceiving of the unlivability of life um, really kind of impact and influence the way that um, the figure of the refugee is scripted, um, you know, such that, uh, you know, a person might even rewrite one's own experience to conform to that narrative. And that's one of the complicated things. And I, I think the criticality of critical refugee studies is sometimes forcing us to ask hard questions about like the refugee as sub as kind of speaking subject and what it what it means to tell the story in a certain way and and so those narratives about i have a chapter on the syria war and drought um have been kind of peddled out by a lot of security experts as a like the a paradigmatic examples of how climate change is causing warfare, it's often associated with um, kind of fears of Islam. Uh, and um, when you dig into the stories, sometimes it is a kind of scripted um, kind of version of the story of, you know, the loss of water, it led, it led to the migration, this is showing how the whole society becomes destabilized. And, you know, are there ways, other ways of reframing the question of water loss um, when we're having so many kind kinds of movements and different ways in which water is being interacted with as a material substance as a, a kind of natural resource but also as um, something where hydrology itself can become part of the mobilizations and the alternatives that people think about so part of what i thought about when thinking about indigeneity with the book had to do with pipeline activism and the ways that indigenous mm -hmm. peoples have been contesting racial capitalism through oil but also, you know, thinking about the ways that people are reframing agriculture and there are radical visions emerging for how, um, you know, maybe maybe less water isn't the end and what kinds of uh, forms of habitation do we forge in the aftermath. So one of the images that I write about in the book is of a family seated around a hearth, not seated, they're standing because there's like two feet of water and they're still cooking. And, and so what does it mean to kind of muddle through all of this when we sometimes might be submerged um, in water where we sometimes might be experiencing no water uh, and, and there are um, ways of disrupting the narratives that might uh, point to some of these submerged um, ways in which reproductive labors are showing decolonial futures. That's my hope at least. <laughs> um, feel like I talked too much but <laughs> no this is this is amazing it's like so fascinating to hear each of you speak about this um if we had more time I would want to hear more about methodology and what overlaps and diverges uh with what each of you did um whether Neil thinks that Neil's book is engaged also in a kind of archipelagic history um mm -hmm uh whether evan if evan were to so it's it, in some sense one one question might be like if each of you wrote the other person's book like how would it be <laughs> how would it be different right and and what might shift right and what so what would come to the fore and what might recede and then what might that tell us um but we are out of time so i will close by sharing we have in the q a kudos an affirmation this is from Keith Feldman, such incredible books. Congratulations and huge gratitude to you both for these powerful contributions. I can only say, I feel the same. These are absolutely stunning, amazing books that everybody must purchase or read for free with open source um, and digest and think about. I mean, these are just absolutely foundationally changing uh books that are going to shift the ground uh that that we walk on and all kinds of assumptions we make so i want to thank you both so much for being here with us today it was wonderful to hear from you thank you thank you so much thank you so much thank you letty and thank you neil it was so wonderful to be in conversation <laughs> all right bye take care bye